my background is actually in physics with a minor philosophy, both from Yale, Milwaukee, and I run a Facebook group called Idealism and Science versus Atheism. And, uh, actually, I threw on Poop Directory too because that's how Tim found me. I, I was writing a blog there, and he found the blog, and next thing you know, he's fighting me over here. So, thank them for that opportunity. Um, so, so where do we begin? Um, the first thing we know about the mind is our own subjective experience about it, right? And so that's not empirical, and so the first thing we have to do is look at philosophy because you can't study something that's subjective with empirical science, per se. So gonna, there's a number of arguments for the immateriality of the mind, and I'm gonna kind of, a lot of this has already been done, it's really solid stuff, but let's kind of run through a couple of this, just to, a couple of these so everyone's on the same page. Uh, so first we have um, Mary the Color Scientist. This is uh, Jackson's knowledge argument. The idea is that uh, Mary is a super scientist who has a like, humongous repository of knowledge in this room she's in, and she has all the tools to study color and all, all the experimental apparatus she needs. And so the thing is, is she, she does this for like a lifetime, and she learns everything there is to know about color completely, uh, even, you know, neurons, running states, even like you know, cones and rods and EM waves. The problem is that she's been locked in this black and white environment since birth and she's never actually seen color. And so the thing is, is she knows everything physical there is to know about color, but then when she leaves the room, she knows something new, which is what color looks like. And so the thing is, if she knows something new in addition to what she already knows, which is physical knowledge, there's an additional, the experience itself is not physical, but immaterial, and so from that, you derive that the, the mind is also immaterial, because it has immaterial experiences. Then there is Plantinga's EAAN, or I'm sure you guys are familiar with that, the evolutionary argument against naturalism. And basically the idea here is that if, you know, evolution produced the brain, which then produced, you know, is, is in the project of neurochemical impulses and all this, your, your, your mental states, then it follows that your mental states, your rationality, are just as trustworthy as the random, or not random, but the, the mindless chemical processes and environmental influences that cause the brain to evolve. So, so you can't trust your own rationality if all there is is dead matter, which is mindless. Then there's Chalmers' P-Zombies. And the idea here is that um, you have an exact replica of the human body which behaves consciously, the neurons are firing exactly as though we're conscious. It's, everything is exactly like you, but it's not conscious inside. And you, you can conceive of this because you can conceive of, you know, you can conceive of dead matter here. The dead matter is not conscious. You can build up machines and that, those are not going to be conscious either. You can just do this until you build a, a machine of a human body from a bunch of atoms, and there's no reason a priori why that should be conscious rather than unconscious. And so, because of this, Whatever the consciousness is, it's not, it's, you can't explain it, the matter that it's you know, produced from. And then there's one of my, oh, oh, Dennis' response to this is pretty funny. Actually, he has the same response for the Mary the Color Scientist, or similar, they're kind of question begging. But um, Dan Dennett, back with Mary the Color Scientist, he argues that the experience of red is encoded in like ones and zeros, right? And so if you get the program, the neural program for what color looks like, you could actually run that program in Mary's mind in the black and white environment and she would see red. But then of course the thing is, is he's questioning that the color red is actually a program of ones and zeros. You can't do that. And then the same thing with the P-Zombies. If he learns more knowledge about brains, eventually he's going to figure out that it has to be a conscious mind rather than not conscious, but that presupposes that matter has the ability to create consciousness, which is not proven yet. So, and then there's my favorite one because this ties the material of the mind directly to uh, epistemology. Basically, you know, Cartesian skepticism. You have Descartes in his meditation saying that you know, we can doubt everything in the, the physical world. The one thing that we can't doubt is the mind. Right? I mean, if you all be in a big dream right now, there's you know. It's called the solid, you know, it'd be bad if I was a solid just talking to an audience, figure this by imagination, but there's something inherently illogical about that, just crazy sounding. So, the thing is, we can doubt the material world, but we can't doubt our minds. So, because of that, our minds cannot be material, because otherwise we could doubt them. So, 
so therefore our minds are definitely not material. And then sometimes um, materialists will kind of sidestep this by saying that the mind is not actually a substance. Now, that they can say that it's immaterial, but they get away with saying that it's not a substance by saying that it's not a thing, it's a process or a property. And the problem with this is the uh, Chinese rule of John Searle. And basically, when you assume that the mind is a process, what you're doing is saying that the mind is basically syntax. So the example here with the Chinese rule is that you have a guy who doesn't know Chinese, no understanding of Chinese whatsoever, and he's getting messages, questions in Chinese through some computer here, and then he looks at the messages and looks up the symbols in the book, and the symbols tell him how to manipulate the syntax in such a way that he can produce understandable answers back in Chinese. And it looks like he's giving intelligent responses in Chinese, but he actually has no understanding of it whatsoever. And so because of that, all that's going on here is his syntax, is all the syntax to run, you know, what looks like intelligent responses that say yeah, a computer, the computer system may play syntax or rules in the same way, but he has no actual understanding of Chinese itself. And so because there's a process can never be conscious, because the process only has syntax, it doesn't have semantic knowledge. And then likewise, if you say emergence, uh, a good example of emergence would be an ant hill being emerged from you know, ants and sand, right? And the problem with that is, is everything you know about an ant hill you can know about from the ants and the sand, and you can then just build up the syntax, you know, some kind of like syntactic arrangements of the ants and sand, and those build up to create an ant hill. But obviously, there's no new actual semantic meaning there, so nothing, emergence can't explain semantics. So, at this point, we have a bunch of very strong arguments for the material out of the mind, and in fact, one of them, the Cartesian skepticism, is so strong that you have to reject basic epistemology to this proof, right? The flip side of this, though, is the arguments against substance dualism. And so, particularly, the interaction problem uh, comes to mind. And actually, I rejected dualism at like, age 14 because I saw this and I couldn't make sense of it. I wasn't a materialist, I thought the legal models were broken. Basically, the problem is this. You have a material, an immaterial mind, and I'm moving my hand right now, that's a material thing, supposedly. My immaterial mind is producing a material force on my hand, right? Well, that's a problem, because immaterial things shouldn't be able to produce material forces, right? That's just illogical to say they can do that, because if they do, they're material, but then that means an immaterial thing is material, which means that it's a contradiction, so you have to throw yourself to stools. So then at this point, we get to the introspective art, which is one of my favorite jujitsu moves. <laughs> so we have a paradox. The mind must absolutely be immaterial based on elementary epistemology. There's no way around this. And yet we look at the interaction problem, which leads to contradiction. The mind cannot possibly be immaterial based on the interaction problem. Well, the catch here is with the second premise. It didn't actually say that the mind can't be material. It said that dualism is false. Everyone assumes dualism to mean that mind and matter, they just take the matter as a given. However, when you turn this on its head, you realize that this situation is impossible, and you realize that maybe the only way to get out of this is to get rid of the other substance. And so there's the introspective argument. Mind can exist even if the material world were an illusion. Matter can't exist if matter is an illusion, and so therefore mind is immaterial. Because mind is a property that matter is not. Substance dualism is false. And so therefore, matter cannot possibly exist, and everything is mind. That was a clever thing. So now the next question, of course, is this seems to kind of negate many of our intuitions about you know, the world, especially when we look at science, because you know, science you think of it, you think of it as an objective world you're studying, it has rules and it exists when you're not looking at it, and so on. And it seems to kind of go against all of our intuitions. But if we look at this closely, that may not actually be the case. But, oh, by the way, this is, I put this in here fine because this atheist always argue against dual, they use the interaction problem to argue against dualism, so I usually grab their argument against dualism and use it upside down. <laughs> and they are defenseless then, and they have no hands basically because they refer to the outside world to defeat it, but I just said that that's got dreams. Oh, I forgot this part. Criticism of the introspective argument. It's about to get into the physics, but I don't know what it is. Um, Basically, 
this, the first one of these was kind of interesting. An atheist pointed this out to me a couple, about a month ago, I think. And he basically said that it presupposes dual, among many of the arguments for the immateriality of the mind presuppose dualism like implicitly, like in Mary the Color Science, for example. You have, um, you know, Mary is learning physical knowledge first, and then she learns immaterial knowledge. And so the argument, of course, is about the mind being immaterial, but you kind of implicitly assume that there is physical knowledge there. And so the question is, that whole argument is framed in such a way that it, it implicitly assumes duals are actually saying as much. And so then the thing is, is you have the interest of the saying dualism and not dualism, and you have a contradiction which can lead to anywhere. The trick of this is, is that it's not actually physical, it's what we call physical, and it's not our subjective experience. Our subjective experience is the, you know, the color green on the screen or whatever, versus the knowledge, the, the, the um, physical, or what we think of as physical reality, which is generated green, which is not actually physically real. It's, a program of God's mind, but it's not part of our consciousness. And so that's the way to get around that. And there's what I like to call presuppositional neuroscientism, which is exactly as it sounds. People assume that the mind is material and say, no, you're wrong in the introspective argument because we know that the physical brain produces consciousness. And, well, the conclusion of the argument says that there is no such thing as the physical brain, so they can't refer back to a brain to disprove the argument. And then lastly, we have the masked man. And the masked man is basically like this. Lois Lane knows that Clark can't, can't fly. Lois Lane knows that Superman can fly. Conclusion, Superman is not Clark Kent. So the idea here is that you think you know something, but you don't actually know it because you have insufficient knowledge of it. And if you had sufficient knowledge of it, you'd realize that what you thought was the case is not actually the case. The problem with this is, is this cannot work on consciousness. And this uh, may, consciousness may be the one thing that this argument can't work on. And the reason for that is, is well, you already know your own consciousness. If you were unaware of your own consciousness, by definition, it would not be your own consciousness because you would not be conscious of it, right? So that's the philosophic half of this. Then we get to the physics of an idealist universe. Sorry, some sinus problems. Um, so let's suppose that we have a young physics student named Albert. Actually, that's Sheldon, the big bang theory, but let's call him Albert for now. And unfortunately, Albert has never, he's never learned about modern physics in his life, for whatever weird reason, just classical physics. And he decides to go to college and become a physicist. Unfortunately, before he goes to college on his way, he gets caught in a car accident and ends up in a comatose state for the next 10 years. And during this comatose state, he is in a lucid dream, okay? The whole time. What? Sheldon doesn't drive. That's true, we're calling him Albert. We're calling him Albert, so. We're getting around that. So now, I may be wrong on this, but I believe I've heard somewhere that the human mind can process velocity up to about 1,000 miles per hour. You can't see anything faster than that. There is, a, there is a maximum limit to what your brain can process as a maximum speed limit. So the thing is, is he doesn't realize he's in a lucid dream. He thinks he's studying physics in college, and he thinks he's becoming a physicist in college. But the thing is, he's actually in this big virtual reality environment in his lucid dream that's being generated by his mind, which can only process frames at 2,000 miles an hour, and render frames at 2,000 miles an hour. So one day he gets on a bullet train going 750 miles an hour north, and there's another bullet train passing him at 750 miles an hour south, right? And the problem is he has a speedometer and he measures the other train, and logically you would expect that train to be going 1,500 miles an hour, right? Just at two velocities. The problem is, is that no matter how fast he goes into this other train, it only goes 1,000 miles an hour. He doesn't realize he's in a lucid dream, and because of that, he doesn't realize that. You know, there's a limitation on how fast things can go in a stream environment, but he just assumes it's real and he thinks this is very strange that the velocity never gets faster than a thousand miles an hour. And when he tries to go faster to actually get to go faster, you know, farther than a thousand miles an hour, he notices that, well, the people in our train seem to be slowing down, the clocks have slowed down, and this is because, well, his brain is using more compute cycles and the whole thing is slowing down like you would when you, you know, load too many pages up on a computer. So, we have two premises here. He decides to develop a theory of physics based on two premises that he observes in the stream environment. The first is the laws of physics are the same in all reference frames, and that's just kind of tautologist, right? It's Galilean relativity, but that's not really specific to a real world or a virtual world. That's just kind of a mathematical given. And the second is there is a maximum velocity that is the same in all reference frames. Now, does anyone here know what you can derive from these two premises? 
No, wrong one. Nice. You, yeah, I he gave you the answers last night. You can't. Yeah. <laughs> you can derive all the mathematics of special relativity from those two premises. So the thing is, he discovered this in a lucid dream, and then he woke up to discover that, lo and behold, this is exactly what's going on in our world right now, the real world, the real world, except that instead of 1,000 miles an hour, it's the speed of light. This is kind of spooky, right? Now, you think that's spooky, it gets worse. Suppose you load up lots of pages on a computer, right? And the computer will start to freeze up and um, you know, slow down. And suppose you, like, say we're in an MM or, or MMORPG, and you're, you spawn a very large object in the game, and that's going to use up more compute cycles and start freezing the computer up. And then let's suppose further that, I don't know, we, we take these, we, we, we split the processing up so that there's processing in each, like a grid on the, on the um, RPG game, right? And so each, each grid processes separately or somewhat separately from the other grids. And so you have some grids that are slowing down, other ones that are not slowing down. And then you can, in theory, take this to infinity and you know, make the grid smaller and smaller and smaller. And you have like, a perfect limit of you know, things slowing down and speeding up. And what's interesting, though, is, well, if you load a large object up, a load, load a large object up in the real world in a small amount of space, does anyone know what happens? A very massive object, what's going to happen if you put a very massive, say, a black hole? What's going to happen to the surface of a black hole, you think? Time slows down, right? Space where there's this general relativity. Well, that's happening in the computer game, too. Now, what's interesting is there's a guy named Ted Jacobson, I believe this was 95, but I'm not certain, and they have this, it's called the holographic principle, where they can define a, a region of space. A region of space is defined by the information content on its surface. And uh, what he showed, though, is that you can actually back engineer general relativity from the holographic principle and entropy. And that's the uh, holographic principle right there. This is equals A over 4, where S is the surface area of the region. Or S is the entropy, A is the surface area of the region, and you have the relation. So now the question, of course, is, is that relates the amount of information of a region, you know, like directly to its surface area. So now what happens if you put more entropy or information in a given region of space that is allowed by that limit? It seems like it would be a, a contradiction, right? You have to fit more space in less space because the space and the information content are linked. Oh, wrong. Well, anyway, what they discovered is that's why space warps. You have a larger region of space, and, or a uh, well, smaller region of space, you put a larger region of space in it, and the only way to fit a larger region of space in a smaller region of space is to warp the larger space such that it dips down and fits into a larger or a smaller area inside of it. Or outside of it. Okay, now, that was relativity. Now we're going to get to quantum mechanics. Now, it turns out you actually see some of these in Minecraft, and I load a couple pages up on this. Um, first, there's quantum tunneling behavior. And you can see here there's a, a fence with cows and chickens passing through it. And interestingly, the chickens are passing through at a slower rate than the cows, right? Now it turns out that when you do the uh, quantum mechanics, you have this way of setting up uh, quantum tunneling or, or math, and the larger, the more massive objects, or objects with higher energy will actually pass through the potential barrier faster, or more probably, than the smaller ones. And you basically see this right here on, on Minecraft. It's like it's a processing effect. It's kind of cool. Like, they discovered this by accident, actually. The, uh, the founder of Second Life had this, and, while they were running the, the beta testing of the game, they had a cup and they put a marble inside the cup and they come back the next day and the marble was on the outside of the cup. And you know, I thought this was kind of spooky and I, I just like a, a TED talk where he's talking about this and he's saying this is really strange because we have a marble, you know, this is exactly what's happening in, in quantum mechanics but we're seeing it in our video games and we didn't, we didn't program this in here, this is just what happened because it's information processing. <laughs> the spookiest thing in the world. And then we have this guy here, which is kind of cool. Okay, let him. If I place two mine carts side by side on this closed loop, you can see they instantly accelerate and they reach maximum speed and keep going round and round and round. Now I'm going to swap over. Okay. Now that one may be a little more arcane, but does anyone know what that might be? 
that resembles, at least, I don't know if this is, that's the reason why this is the case, this is just kind of an interesting parallel, but that closely resembles Cooper pairing in superconductivity. You have two uh, phonons in a superconductive material and they will keep transmitting each other without limit, with no resistance, and then it'll just keep going without limit. And you see the same thing here, that the two mine carts Cooper pair and they just keep running on the track without stopping, basically. So, and of course, there's pixelation. You can see pixelation on all those little screens. So, oop, my bad. Okay, now we get to quantum non-realism. Now, this is where it gets really interesting because uh, there's actually experimental uh, data on this that's been published in Nature and so on. This, this drives people completely crazy. First, we have to talk about the EPR paradox, though. This is um, when Einstein didn't want to believe in quantum mechanics. He said, you know, he tried to come up with thought experiments to prove that it couldn't be right. And so he suggested, let's put two particles into a single wave function together, joint superposition, and they have then moved them apart, right? Say a, a dead cat and a live cat, or a, a one cat, which is, or two cats, one is dead, the other one's going to be alive, but you know, it's just that the gun either shoots one or the other, not both. But before you collapse the wave function, they're both dead and alive at once. They're spread out, and then you, you measure one, and then it's either dead or alive, and that instantly changes the other states miles away into something dead or alive itself, the opposite state. And of course, this is kind of spooky because this you know, resembles voodoo dolls. And, well, we don't do voodoo dolls in physics, so that's just crazy. And so we call this spooky action at a distance, right? But this is impossible, and um, this is a, a this proof of quantum mechanics of thought. So then later on, uh, it's the 1980s, I believe, or in the 70s, John Bell decided he's going to actually test this, and he puts uh, a, a theorem uh, in equality to tell, test whether or not Einstein's spooky action actually happens or not, right? And um, then they, they actually tested this with quantum entanglement, and they discovered that, lo and behold, these two particles actually do affect each other at vast distances. Which is, you know, the craziest thing ever in physics, you know, using it now to uh, develop quantum teleportation. And so the thing, though, is that when he did this, he combined the notion that basically he thought that maybe there is some hidden variable there, and it's not actually in the state that it's in, and actually in like some superposition of states, it actually was either dead or alive before you looked at it. And but there's some hidden variable that determines whether it's dead or alive. We just don't know it yet. We can't find it. So this would then determine if there were hidden variables there. The, hidden, the local hidden variables were ruled out because you know, they're not the location of you know, the cats. One cat's like a million miles away from their cats. There's going to be no hidden variables over here that affect it over there. So then the only option left was non-local hidden variables. And the idea there is that maybe somehow there's some weird radio signal going faster than light all the way over to the second cat. But that violates relativity. But you know, they say quantum mechanics and relativity don't appear to be compatible anyway, so they're just going to test quantum mechanics separately. Well, then later on in 2007, Anton Zellinger, who's a very famous physicist from Vienna, uh, tested another set of inequalities called Leggett's inequalities, and these actually tested for non local hidden variables. The possibility that there's a, you know, a hidden influence traveling faster than like the other particle. And these were also disproven. So now we can't have either local realism, which those inequalities rule that out. But you could still have you know, either locality or realism. The problem, though, is that legacy inequalities ruled out non-local realism as well. So we got rid of local realism and non-local realism together, and therefore we no longer have realism. And uh, Physics World actually had an article on this, and they, the article was kind of funny sounding, but the title was um, Quantum Physics Says Goodbye to Reality. So that was kind of cool. Now that's kind of an indirect test of this, right? They, they, can, they can tell that there's non-realism here, but they, they can't see it, you know, if I get it directly, that's where we get to the Copen Specker theorem, which is sometimes called the no reality theorem of quantum mechanics. And um, did a test of this a couple of years ago only, and it basically resembled the, the three cups in the ball trick. You see it like, you know, surfaces. And um, the idea was to try to pick one cup to put the balls under, and no matter which cup you pick, it's almost under the wrong ball. Well, they did this with photon location stuff. It's spread out to like three different locations, and if you pick one variable, it's not going to be in the place you want you, you thought it was going to be. And no matter which one you pick, it's always going to be the one that you didn't pick. And so this is weird because 
I mean, think about it, if, if the ball, if the photon actually was in one of those places before you look at it, right, then you would expect at least a third of the time getting it right. You won't get it right any of the time because of that you can't conclude the photon was literally not in any of those places before you looked at it. It just wasn't there before you looked at it. Which is kind of spooky, right? <laughs> so then Anton's allowing us to the conclusion of the experiment is there is no sense in assuming that what we do not measure about the system has reality. Now, I've seen this objection a couple of times. People raise this. They said that the kind of realism that quantum mechanics is talking about is not the, uh, not the same as philosophic realism. When you look at the definitions of both of these, there, it's pretty obvious they're the same thing, at least so as far as perception is concerned. So you have philosophical realism, which says physical reality is just independent of observation, and then quantum realism, or counterfactual definiteness, that says the state of a quantum system exists independent of observation. Well, physical reality is supposed to be made of quantum states, right? So if that's the case, you can just say the state of a quantum system is the same as physical reality, and then you see these two are the same thing. One's just in scientific terminology, and the other one is in philosophic terminology. Now we get to the issue of macro-realism. You've probably heard a lot of times people say that, um, you know, Quantum mechanics goes at the small scale, but it's completely irrelevant to the large scale of human observers and so on. And this is actually false. Um, in quantum mechanics, you can have a, a system of larger and larger objects, and it will still have a, a wave function. The wave function will get really tiny, but it's still going to be there, so quantum mechanics will still be applicable. It's, there is no like difference between quantum and classical other than like human convention. It's just that it's, classical is just quantum with really, really, really tiny wave functions. So anyway, though, they had a way to test this, just to kind of rule it out anyway, and call these the legged carbon inequalities. And these were falsified by Johannes Koffler uh, and Kostel Bruckner in 2011. Those are uh, students of Zeilinger, actually. And then since then, they discovered, uh, and before that, nanoscopic quantum superpositions. There was, uh, might have heard about this, they had, but they had like bucking balls in superposition. They also had, um, recently, diamonds, USB C with the naked eye in superposition. Yeah, I've heard somewhere, I don't, I, I dig this up somewhere, but they have very sensitive instruments that's uh, LIGO, so they use it to study gravity waves. And um, I think I heard, don't quote me on this, but I think I heard they had a one-ton object, two-ton object in superposition. They're using this to measure gravity waves. They're very, very special conditions. So you have macroscopic objects you can see with the naked eye in quantum superposition. And then they have the, they call the clumsiness loophole, which says that basically maybe we're doing the experiments wrong, and it's not, macro realism is actually true, but the way we're doing the experiments is such that we can't actually tell if macro realism has been falsified or not. And so because that, they have this, the rule of that loophole out, they develop the uh, hybrid bell legged guard inequality. That hasn't been tested yet, but this is a quote from the paper on the tech of what would be required for this to work. So a realistic explanation of an observed violation requires either the failure of the bell locality, a bell locality, or a preparation conspiracy of finally to the non locally correlated notes. Well, the first half of this we know is false, because we already have seen quantum entanglement, that's that's bell locality. So then the other problem though is well, a preparation conspiracy. That's code word for divinely planted fossils, basically. So they're, they're kind of if they want to argue for macro realism, they've got a real problem on their hands, basically. Now, another thing, I've seen people argue this before, and this is kind of a, they assume the wrong things when I say that realism is false. And so, basically they think that, you know, if realism is false, and quantum mechanics applies to large scale, that means that, you know, we should see quantum tunneling and teleportation at a macro scale, and obviously we don't see that. And the thing here is that, like I said before, the quantum world doesn't actually disappear in the classical scale, it just gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you get to the classical scale, and it's so astronomically tiny that for all practical purposes it's not there, but for all practical purposes it's not the same as it's really not there. It, it's, it's there, it's just so very tiny that it's negligible, we don't see it. Like, you know, if we live in the matrix right now, here's an example, if you zoom in really, really far, you can see the bizarre information processing effects in the matrix, right? But you wouldn't see at the classical scale, you'd see, you know, people walking around in like everyday life. But the catch though is that 
and none of it's actually real. Just because it looks like it's classical, it behaves classically, it doesn't mean it's real. You know, determine whether it's real is going deep down and seeing how it behaves at the tiny scale. So now we get to the more one of the now that was the last part was interesting. This part is even more interesting. This gets really crazy. Now locality in space time. So firstly, we have the holographic principle. And uh, this was derived uh, based on considerations of trying to figure out how much information you could, I mean, basically how many questions you could ask about a region of space before it turns into a black hole. So how much information you can extract. And there are limits on this, actually, based on Heisenberg and Sergio principle and some stuff in general to me. So there's a, a limit to how much information you can get out of a region of space before it, it explodes into, implodes into a black hole. Now, Likewise, there was this other thing called the Bekenstein bound, which got into this whole paradox regarding black holes and entropy. And they discovered, as a result of this, that black holes, can, the, the area of a, a black hole is directly proportional to the amount of entropy contained inside of it. And further, what they discovered is that the amount of information in the, the first part of this is exactly that you can start from a region of space before it implodes, is identical to the Bekenstein bound. And that's when we get the EDFC of the correspondence. So there's no additional information that goes with the black hole you could ever learn about because you know you, you ask too many questions and it turns into a black hole before you can ask the next question. The limit of the amount of information inside the black hole is equal to the information on the surface of the black hole. And that's why they call it the holographic principle, because it's everything going on inside the black hole is a holographic projection from the surface of the black hole. And well, this applies to space time in general because they decided they determined that space time is actually a hologram. Probably heard about the holographic universe before, I'm guessing. So then we have the Big Bang, and this was kind of a giveaway because I mean, you think about you probably seen like you know William Lane Craig and Carol debating this, the Kalam and all, and so then, but if you think about this kind of in physics terms, it doesn't make sense in a way. You you go back in time, and then at some point there is no Big Bang, right? In fact, the universe is a hologram that makes sense too. Entropy is always diminishing as you go back in time. And at some point, entropy diminishes to zero, and there's no space time left. So the thing is, how does that happen? Because you have you know, space, time, energy, and matter is everything physical, right? But space, time, energy, and matter disappear at the Big Bang, which makes no sense. And you could say, it was a miracle that did it, and would you be right in a sense? But the problem is, is trying to model that in terms of physics, you end up needing to explain whatever, the, whatever caused the Big Bang was in terms of being non-physical outside of space, time, energy, and matter. And so then space and energy and matter are just, you can think about this, physics have to be an emergent effect from whatever is not physical. So I mean, everything we see right now is an emergent effect from whatever it was before the Big Bang, which was not material or physical in any sense. Then we get to quantum entanglement and non-realism. Now this is kind of cool when you tie the implications of non-realism that we just discussed together with quantum entanglement. So firstly, who here remembers middle school geometry when you're asked to define a space? Know what you're supposed to do? It's really simple. You'll probably laugh when you, like, I tell you this, but. Um, oh, no, I'm laughing because I can't remember. Okay, <laughs> you start with a point, right? You start with a point, you add another point, two points, and they make a line, one dimensional space, where you have a third point, and you, you have a 2D space, and so on and so forth. And if you don't have points or locations, the, it's talking about space doesn't mean anything, right? I mean, a space without any defined locations is not a space, right? But here's the problem. Before a collapse, you have two entangled particles. They're both inside of a wave function. Everything in a wave function is not real. It's not physically there. The locations are not physically there either, right? That, that's part of it. So two particles do not have physical locations before collapse. And because of that, well, the space between those two particles does not exist before collapse either. Well, that's kind of weird, right? So there's, there's no space between those two particles, even though from our perspective, they're like miles apart. Now, here's the crazy thing. You can keep writing wave functions for larger and larger systems. Just keep adding energy into the, the Schrodinger equation, and it keeps building up and building up and building up, and you get wave functions for having larger and larger objects. And in fact, they even have an equation called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, which is used in quantum gravity, which defines a wave function for the entire universe. And when you're not looking at, you know, so you isolate yourself from the rest of the universe, the rest of the universe is in superposition, perspective, right? And the definition of entanglement is when two or more particles are in superposition with each other. Wait a minute, that means that everything is entangled. The entire universe is entangled in one giant wave function. 
but the space between entangled particles and the wave function does not exist. Therefore, the entire space-time continuum doesn't exist before measurement. Space is a giant illusion of observation. Now, that sounds completely crazy, right? Like there is no space. I mean, but there are actually some quotes from some very famous physicists saying the same thing. And this was back way a long time ago. This was a, a letter that Albert Einstein wrote to David Bohm. And they were talking about trying to merge quantum mechanics into relativity and you know, big problems with this. And so Einstein said in his letter, he said, we have to find a possibility to get rid of the continuum together with space and time altogether. But I have not the slightest idea what kind of elementary concepts we use in such a theory. So basically he's saying we have to find something more fundamental in space and we have to find a way to do away with space time entirely. And he wasn't aware of digital physics and the idea of information doing it. So he, you know, didn't have computers back then to draw as a reference, so he didn't know what to do with it, but he knew that this is where the answer was. Now later on we have Fatini Markopoulou of the Perimeter Institute. She's one of the top loop quantum gravity theorists in the world. And uh, this is from a uh, World Science Festival panel. So space-time is not fundamental. Space-time is, if you like, kind of emergent effect from something else that underlies it, and that something else could be information of the law on length. We have more. This is from a lecture he gave. My guess is just space doesn't exist. Now remember, <laughs> that, that sounds nuts. The catch is, is she's not just like a physicist, she's actually a very famous physicist, and she's the top of her field. Like, like she, she's the go -to, one of the go-to people. We want to talk about loop quantum gravity. Now, this is the other top loop quantum gravity theorist in the world. This guy's an atheist. I don't think he realizes the philosophical implications of his theory, but this is in his book, Three Roads to Quantum Gravity. He said, when we imagine we are sitting in an infinite three-dimensional space, we are falling through the fallacy in which we substitute what we see for an intellectual construct. And elsewhere in the book, he says that once we go back to the Big Bang, he actually says, before that, there is no space, it's just information. Now, think about this for a second. As Christians, what does this sound like? How did God create the universe? You don't get to respond, and Tim doesn't get to respond either because you both know the answer, but well, what, what, what did, how did God create the universe in Genesis? He spoke it. You don't speak words, you speak word, you know, you speak words or information. You don't speak matter, you speak words or information, right? And so we have words or information before the Big Bang programming the universe. <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> This is really spooky. I mean, like, literally, it, 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 it seems supernatural, and yet you can see it in the physics, and you're like, this is like Twilight Zone stuff at this point, because it's, is it, is it natural or supernatural? <laughs> Here's some more. Uh, the analogy between the history of the universe and the flow of information in the computer is the most rational scientific analogy I could make. And then we have uh, Hermann Berlin, who's the, the string theorist, not a loop quantum gravity theorist. He's a the brother of Eric Berlin, who's also a very famous physicists in the same field, and he's working on emergent space-time, too. And he says, information is going to be our starting point, and space-time is not something that we start with. We forget about what space is and time is. And by thinking about what the information is doing, then space-time will be emergent. It will come out of just a bunch of zeros and ones. That's pretty radical, isn't it? Uh, now, there, I will mention as uh, just, you know, we went through a whole lot of parallels between information processing and you know, our universe. But there's a guy named Brian Whitworth, who's a computer scientist, and he did kind of a survey of this, and like some 20 or 30 things that were weird, seen as weird in modern physics. You know, we see relativity as weird, we see quantum mechanics as weird, but we don't relate them, we just see them both as weird, and they both are really bizarre, right? What he did was he took an entire list of this all the way down the line, right? And um, he uh, basically said, let's compare this to an objective reality, and let's compare this to a virtual reality and see which one fits the data. All the quote unquote weird things that you see in modern physics exactly resemble the effects of information processing in virtual realities, like all down the line, which is kind of spooky to think about. There's another guy named Tom Campbell who's a NASA physicist. He's not Christian. He like believes in like reincarnation and gets into like some really weird stuff that I'd be dead if I got talking about in front of atheists. <laughs> But, so I don't even bother going there, but he actually, he's kind of promoting this doing. He's, he's got some very interesting, um, like the foundation for his argument is very solid. He goes, goes off into some crazy territory, but like the, the basic theory of the argument is, is very solid and tied into physics. So then, of course, we have consciousness in physics, and this is a big scare word to most physicists. Most, most physicists don't like it when you bring consciousness into physics because it's 
if, if you're not careful, you're going to end up with people calling you Deepak Chopra. But if you're very careful with your physics, you can, you know, kind of minimize. <laughs> you, you, you point out that you know what you're talking about, and use all the, the peer reviewed material, and all you say. Do, do your homework, basically, you won't end up talking yeah, stupid. Say it like it's a bad thing to be called Deepak. <laughs> you know, you know. Like that, right? <laughs> So I have a couple of ways to get around this. One thing I like doing is oftentimes we hear like consciousness causes collapse of the wave function, and that's where people say your B factor up right and boo and so on. Um, what I like to do sometimes is I call hybrid arguments and I short circuit. I mean, obviously we know consciousness is fundamental because you can't reduce consciousness. It just seems intuitively obvious. The only reason anyone thinks otherwise is because they're trying to bash a square peg into a round hole with you know, AI research or material neuroscience. So they hate this though because this kind of short circuits through their, their positivist thinking. And what I do is I simply say, we have the physics on the one side, we have the philosophy on the other side. The roles of illusion, you know, Cartesian skepticism says, even if the roles of illusion, your mind is not, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I just proved that the role actually is an illusion. So we then have this problem because that means that our mind cannot be an illusion. If our mind is part of the physical world, that means it's part of an illusion, and our mind is an illusion, which is you can't do that. That, that destroys your rationality. This is because that the mind has to be more fundamental than physical reality. And if the rest of the world is an illusion, that obviously leads to idealism. And you have another cool one. This is Quantinga's evolutionary argument against naturalism combined with something called the Conway Coken free will theorem. And the idea here, they use, I think you make this argument from quantum erasers, and you can also make it from, they have a more complex one that I don't fully understand. But the conclusion of this was that if free will exists, that means that the world must be an illusion. And likewise, if free will does not exist, that means the world must be material and, and linked to it. Like if, if materialism is true, free will cannot exist. If idealism is true, free will must exist. So they're, like, they're linked here. So basically, either you collapse the wave function determine the particle's property, or the particle's property determines you. Mm -hmm. That was kind of tied back to that, that Copen spectrum thing I explained to you before. You pick which cup it is, and the particle picks out a property when you look at it, and not when you don't look at it. So then you say, well, if the world is an illusion, or if the world isn't an illusion, then free will can't exist. And you say, well, we have to have free will because free will presupposes rationality, and so therefore the world has to be an illusion simply because we have free will. And if you disagree with free will, we don't have, you know, you get rid of your rationality. Now, we get up to the, the big one, the, uh, the big dirty word, or big dirty phrase, consciousness causes collapse. And they will avoid this like the flood, even though logically, this simply follows from the Copenhagen interpretation. Now, I don't actually buy Copenhagen myself, but if you do adopt it, and a lot of physicists do, uh, what's called the von Neumann interpretation, which is consciousness causes collapse, comes directly out of Copenhagen. And basically, you know, it's from the famous Wigner's friend thought experiment where you have uh, the famous Schrodinger's cat in a box, which is neither dead nor alive, where you look. And you, you look at that and it's dead or alive. Well, let's suppose that Wigner's doing the experiment, but he decides to go out to lunch and he leaves his friend in the laboratory to do the experiment, right? So he comes back to lunch, he doesn't open the door yet, and there's a superposition of a dead cat and a sad friend, or a live cat and a happy friend, right? So the, 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 but his friend is the one doing the collapse, but he's not collapsed yet himself. And so because of that, with respect to Wigner, none of that, that's still in limbo. And you could always replace a, you know, the friend with a, a measuring apparatus, like a, a photo detector or something like that. And um, so ultimately, at some point, with respect to you, it's going to have to turn that on your consciousness, right? So therefore, consciousness should cause collapse. Now, what's funny was, was it a year ago or two years ago, Zollinger did a poll on physicists, there's a small sampling of them, there's only like 33 physicists in the, in the poll, I think. So this is not necessarily representative. But they were asked questions about their, what their views of quantum mechanics were. And one of the questions is, what role does the observer play in quantum mechanics? 50 some percent said, the observer plays a role in the formalism, but no distinguished physical role. Then only 6% said, the observer plays a, a significant role in the natural physics, right? And then by, by what, they, what they described by distinguished physical role was consciousness causes collapse in the parentheses. What's very funny here is that other 54%, I think it was, they were saying that it's actually in the formulas, and that's the math, right? It's in the formulas and the consciousness causes collapse. Yet they then go on and says, but it's not actually in the physics. So in other words, we believe our physics, 
that it's going to do this, except when it comes to consciousness, then we're not going to believe our physics and we're going to say there's got to be something wrong here. Mm-hmm. Which is kind of ridiculous because it's, it's schizophrenia. It's like we believe our math predicts reality, yet our math does not predict reality. Which is insane. But so um, now the reasons for this are well, firstly, there's instrumentalism, you could say it's kind of a one possibility. The problem with that is, is instrumentalism is only when you want to study something that you don't know much of, right? Well, we've known about quantum mechanics for almost 90 years now, right? So that really doesn't work. And um, besides, we've ruled out all the, the hidden variables, so even if, you know, even if you still want to do that, you have no justification for that because we've ruled out all the things that it could have been anyway, so there's nothing left to explore at that point, right? And then, of course, the last one is the real, this is the real thing, is anti-anthropocentric bias. Like, I, uh, I was having an argument with an atheist about this, with some physics background, and he was saying, well, we don't know what quantum mechanics is, you know, why it does behave this weird way, but we know for certain that it's not anything you know, can observe as anthropocentric as a, a, as a conscious mind doing it, right? Like, we all know that conscious minds have only been around since, you know, very recently, and before that, there was billions of years where there was no conscious minds. And like, uh, your your question begging against the conclusion here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you can't do that. You know, you, you, and besides, you can't say we don't know what it is, but we know for certain that it's not that. <laughs> Which is kind of irritating when they, they point that out. Oh, by the way, with the von Neumann and Copenhagen thing, um, I actually pressed a, a physicist at Brookhaven from Brookhaven, and I got into a conversation with him. And he was insisting this was nonsense until I actually pinged him in with the solid the physics. Like, you know, what about von Neumann chains? Finally, he kind of lost it. And he said, like, kind of blurted out, we don't know, uh, nobody actually believes in quantum mechanics. It's, it's predicted everything we've done, you know, every experiment ever, but no one actually believes it. And it's ridiculous because it would be contradictory if it was true. I'm like, mm-hmm. uh, no, it's contradictory if you assume realism that there has to be a, a material explanation for it. Mm-hmm. And he kind of got flustered, blocked off. It was just kind of funny because I kind of pressed it in like at that point he like realizes that he has no argument and that was the end of it. And the last one, now not everyone holds the Copenhagen or von Neumann, so that only applies to people that hold that. There is MWI or the many worlds interpretation. And this one actually kind of works, but there are some problems with it, which we'll get to just here. So many worlds says that the cat it's not that the cat is neither dead nor alive, you know, it, it doesn't have a property, it's that it's dead and alive, but these are two separate universes, and when you look it splits off into a dead universe and a live universe. And this sort of works for, you know, there's you know, a superposition of states and the wave function at all, so you can kind of interpret those universes like that. The trouble with this is, is that this works really well for 50-50 probabilities. Once you go outside of 50-50 probabilities, you have humongous problems with this. This is, uh, they call this the Born rule, the, the quantum probability rule. You can't derive the Born rule from MWY. They contradict the Born rule. So, for example, let's suppose that the little radioactive isotope that causes the cat to either be dead or alive only has a 66 or a 33% chance of decaying and a 66% chance of not decaying, right? So, the issue here now is that you have to, to explain that probability, you need two universes that are identical where the cat is alive and one where it's dead, right? So, you have to clone, you have to find some additional mechanism to clone parallel universes whenever you have a probability that's different than 50 50. And then when you get to really interesting probabilities, this becomes more problematic. For example, um, let's suppose that we have a probability of 136 chances out of 140 chances, right? So in this case, you have to have, say, 34 universes of the cat is alive and one universe of the cat is dead, right? Now, we get to 137 over 140. Now, does anyone know what 137 is? It's a prime number. So you get to 137 universes, all of a sudden you have to, you went from 34 universe, 35 total parallel universes, and all of a sudden you need 138 parallel universes because you have to have separate universes for, you can't, you can't, you know, divide the universes down to clusters of universes. You have to have, to explain the full prime number, you have to have all 137 universes and only one universe that, you know, that's where the cat's dead. Then you get to or alive. Then you end up, after that, say, you can take a little more time and you get to 138, right? 138 chances out of 140 because it, it's for a cohort of time and higher chance to radar. I still have to do okay? And now the problem is, is, well, 140, that's 69 and 1, right? It's 
69 chances for us going to be dead and one chance for us going to be alive. So now we have this problem where we just we went from 34 universes where it's dead or uh, dead and then or alive and 137 where it's dead and then all of a sudden down to 69 where it's dead. So you have to clone, find some mechanism to clone the universe, find another mechanism to factor prime numbers, and then find another uh, mechanism to shrink the number of universes again after the things decay. So there are problems with this. Now let's suppose that they find some way to get around this. The trouble is, is that we actually have discovered a way now to not, they haven't figured this out fully yet, but they think this is the lead. It's called the amplitudehedron. This is like very recent stuff, like just from last year. And basically what they discovered is that um, there is a way to calculate quantum probabilities. They have a, a theory to explain why there are quantum probabilities. It's called the amplitude meter. And anyway, this is for particle physics, which is related to quantum mechanics, but not quite the same field. And um, so before this, they would have what they call Feynman diagrams, where they have these you know, two particles or three particles interacting, and these little golden lines between them. Based on these lines, you can, they tell a physicist how to calculate how the particles can interact. And for simple interactions, this works, but the problem is a lot of the calculations they do, this becomes very long and tedious, and it's so long and tedious that you need supercomputers to do it, and supercomputers will sit in this for like a month to do this, right? Now, the cool thing about the amplitudehedron is that they found a way now to do the, all that work that was previously done in like months. They can do that now on a single sheet of paper just by short, like physics do this on shorthand by a single sheet of paper. The catch, the reason the amplitude heater works though is because they're modeling the particles as though they're not interacting with each other inside of space time. And so our best clue right now as to explaining why quantum probabilities exist is predicated on the notion that space time is actually an illusion. So even if MWI holds, there's still very likely that you could probably explain quantum mechanics, you still going to need to explain, uh, describe space time as an illusion. So. That's that. And then basically the conclusion here is our world is virtual reality. This is all the, all the physics, you know, you saw that the quantum, quantum gravity is, you know, people think that science supports atheism, right? Like that's kind of the implied assumption. Well, the top of physics, uh, top of science is physics, and the top of physics is quantum gravity, and quantum gravity people are saying that space time doesn't exist and everything's described with information and matters out there when you look at it. So we're in the matrix and there is no spoon. <laughs> now, there is this other thing, this is kind of an odd possibility, simulism. Who here has heard of Bostrom simulation right now? Basically, he argues that, you know, we have Sims games, right? And, you know, we play on that, and we make little people, and they have little lives, and so on. So he theorized, what if in the future we have artificially intelligent Sims, and these simulations become so powerful that they look real, they can, you know, all the details of their lives are perfectly, different, like, just like ours, right? indistinguishable from ours. And then the thing is, is though, you say you sell Sims Universe to you know, the general populace, everyone's going to buy a copy and they're going to have universe simulators everywhere. And it's going to be, you know, say a whole plant, someone's going to have in their computer in their basement a whole plant full of six billion people that think they're real people. And the guy next door is going to have the same thing and so on. You're going to have an entire country full of people playing Sims Universe with literally hundreds of trillions of simulated people and only six or seven billion people that are real. So now, based on this, what's the chance that we're living in the real world right now and not in someone else's simulation 30 years in advance from us? It seems pretty low, right? Like, the, the chances that we're going to be the 6 billion rather than the 100 trillion or, you know, 10 quadrillion or something is going to be very small. So, based on this, the argument that we're almost certainly living in a simulation. So then the problem is, for idealism, is what if the next level down is material simulation, right? It does actually matter. Now, the way around this is to realize the nature of qubits versus classical bits, and what it means to simulate a qubits versus simulate a classical bits. So now, qubits, you can store a zero and a one in the same state, or the cat is both dead or alive, or you know, it's spin up or spin down, and so in this case, it's using this as digital information in a computer, a quantum computer, you have ones and zeros. But there's like a, a, a thing, like there's multiple states per bit, whereas a classical state, classical bit only has one state, right? So, the thing now is you have um, this problem, because we have qubits in our world, and if our world is a, a computer simulation, that means that any classical world, which is not going to be quantum mechanical and weird and not real, is going to have to explain all those, describe all those qubits in terms of classical bits. And to do that, because there's all these different states in there, you're going to have to unpack all the qubits 
in the classical bits. And so one and zero superposition is just one example. You can have like many hundreds of thousands of ones and zeros added together in a single qubit. So if you're going to unpack all of those, you're going to have a hard drive which is ridiculously large, and if you want to simulate a whole universe with 10 to the 92nd power qubits, you're going to have a computer in, they're, 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 the computer they're going to have to build will have to be bigger than their own universe. Like it's going to be like ridiculously large, so there's no reason to build a universe like that, or a computer like that, so just simulate a class whole bit. So because of that, even if we are in a simulation, the next level down is also going to be not real. So it, it holds no matter what, basically. So then finally we get to my last argument, the digital physics argument. Basically, our world is a virtual construct generated from integrated information, and then conscious states are integrated information. Now, the guy that came up with this idea was Tononi, and the cool thing about this is, people say they don't know what consciousness is, and there's a big debate even among materialists that have like, you know, four or five positions of what, you know, non-reductive materialism or limited materialism or Type C materialism and so on, and then you have various surprise of dualism and neutral monism and so on. The cool thing with integrated information is that it kind of short circuits past all that and says, well, we don't really know what consciousness is, but we know what it feels like, right? And we can always, you know, quantify what it feels like. I mean, you just think about your own conscious experience for a second, you're, you're seeing, you know, the, the PowerPoint, you're feeling the desk, you're thinking about the thoughts in your head. All those things are information, right? Even though your own eye is a self thought or whatever. So you have just information and it's all integrated such so that it's you can form meaningful content out of it. And so just on pure introspection, your own conscious state is integrated information. So that's just what a, a conscious state is. So the thing is, is we've already proven that our world is in a virtual reality running with integrated information. So an in, integrated information theory holds no matter what you know theory of mind you have, because that's the one thing everyone can agree on is what the conscious experience is like. It's kind of ontology. So you put those two together, you get the conclusion that our universe is a conscious state, and then premise three is conscious state exists inside the minds, and then therefore the universe is inside the mind of God. And that is it.